I want to further our adventure in becoming the uncommon church once again. Now, thus far, we have discovered that the uncommon church shares a common profession, it shares a common purpose, it shares a common bond. And these common elements make a dramatic difference between what we see as a common church today and what was recognized as the church in Scripture. So today, it is my desire to continue adding to the attributes of Scripture that would create an uncommon church in our communities this morning. Now, the attributes we've dealt with so far alone do not an uncommon church make. Uh, sure, if we're gathered together under the confession that Jesus is Lord and we're actively striving to make disciples and we're united together under the bonds of love, who is this going to get? So, Jim, they're saying they can't hear me in the back. Okay. Okay. Is that better? All right. We'll go with that here. Um, but if we have all of those things, that definitely makes us a more uncommon church than many we see today. But we are still short of what the biblical church is revealed to be. So this morning as we continue looking in Scripture, I want to look in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For there I believe we will find the fourth attribute of the uncommon church and discover that we must also have a common message. If you would, I invite you to stand to honor God's presence upon His Word as we read this passage together. And look in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 for the common message of an uncommon church. And Romans 1, 16 through 17 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For it is God's righteousness, in it God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let us pray. Our Father, as we look to your word this morning, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear you. That we would know you better, that we would know you more. That, Father, your word would permeate deep within us and that the common message of the uncommon church, Lord, would take root in any heart, Father, where it has not yet done so. And that, Father, it would give great strength to continue forward into the hearts and lives of those who may know you deeply, but, Father, whose way may be becoming very difficult. We pray, Lord, that it will give us guidance and direction and strength that you would speak to us today and that we would hear and respond. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. For Paul, the common thread of all of his writing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't just say that because I, I can say that. Um, I say that because when I was doing my doctoral work, I had to read everything Paul wrote in the Bible a lot. And as I continued to read the letters of Paul, I discovered that whether Paul was dealing with immorality in the church at Corinth, or if he was dealing with false teaching in the church at Colossae, or if he was providing pastoral advice to Titus, the gospel is always the central tenet of what Paul is writing about. Everything that spawns in Paul's writing is rooted in the gospel. And so I began to ask myself, why is the gospel so important to Paul? And as I looked to the book of Romans and realized that in Romans, Paul is basically writing a missionary support letter to the church of Rome. It is Paul's desire to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to Rome, and then from Rome to go further westward. And yet, Paul has never been to Rome. He is not a part of the founding of the church in Rome. 
And so he has written this letter by way of saying, Hi, I'm Paul. I want to come and do mission work. Let me tell you who I am and what I believe. And would you believe that Paul starts and ends the book of Romans talking about the gospel and his understanding of the gospel and just what the gospel is and why it matters. And I go back and say, why is this so important? And as Paul makes abundantly clear throughout the book of Romans, it is important because it really is the message that unites Christ's church. It is the common message of the New Testament church. It was the litmus test for whether or not somebody gathered together with other folks qualified as being a church. The gospel was the beginning and end of the common message that existed in the New Testament church. And so when we look at Romans, and particularly in these verses here, we find why this message is so essential and what we should do about it. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to take a few moments to define just what is the gospel. And then I want to emphasize the two unique elements of the gospel that are only found there. Next week, what I will do is then take some time based on the two unique elements of the gospel to share the challenge of the gospel for his church. And so we will be dealing with this, these verses in two parts, but today we want to define the gospel and identify the two unique elements that are only available through the gospel. And so as we begin... Defining the gospel, we must really start with the term itself. The word gospel really means good news. It is news that is joyful. It is news that is beneficial. It is a message of hope and a message of reconciliation. And the message the gospel offers to humanity brings about the answers to life's greatest problems and questions. The gospel itself begins with the reality of God's creation of all things and His authority over all things. The foundation of the gospel is that God is the creator and the sustainer of all that is. That is the beginning line of the gospel message. From this creation event we find that the second portion of the gospel is that man broke his perfect relationship with God and with each other through sin. The reality is man has sinned. Every man throughout history and woman for that, in that regard has sinned against their creator. And as a result broke their relationship with him and with each other. This sin has infected all of humanity and it is the cause of all death, damage, and suffering in the world today. Now, does that mean that everything that happens is direct judgment of specific sin? No, it does not. The reality is there is just common judgment that takes place. Jesus talks about an event where some men ask him, um, you, did you hear about the, the Jews that were slaughtered by the Romans while they were giving their sacrifice. And Jesus looks at them and says, Well, yeah, did you think the guys at the Tower of Siloam fell on were any more unrighteous than anybody else? No, these guys aren't more unrighteous because of what happened to them. They're just suffering the common judgment that befalls sin. When we see hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and devastation, that is common judgment on sin. But at the same time, Sin also brings about specific judgment that our individual actions bring about. If you steal, there is a specific judgment that is brought forth by the government as God's instrument for your theft. 
And if you commit different sins, there are specific judgments that befall that. Sin causes death, damage, and suffering. That is its consequence in this life. Sin, to be defined, is anything less than the perfection of God. And consequently, it must be punished by the Creator God because He has revealed Himself to be both holy and just. So when you want to think about God, you can think about Him in, in four, three things that have already been revealed. One, that He created everything. That He is perfectly holy. And that He is absolutely just in everything He does. Those are three elements in the gospel. However, because of the love of God towards His creation, this Creator had a plan for the punishment of sin so that we could return to a right relationship yeah. with Him. And so God in His love, so God is also loving, He has provided a means by which the penalty for sin can be judged and we can still be in relationship with Him, a right relationship. As a result of this, God and His plan entered humanity as the God-man Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He was 100% man and 100% God 100% of the time. And throughout His life, He lived in a way that fulfilled all of the requirements of a perfect God. And then, through his death, paid the penalty for all sin. Through the death of Jesus Christ, God pours out his wrath on sin and displays his perfect love for his creation. And anything that misappropriates the fact that God's wrath was poured out and his love was displayed is a fallacy in our understanding of what happened with the Christ. And so in that event, the loving God's justice was satisfied. And so, through his death, we are able to have a relationship with God once again. But not only in his death, but three days later, Christ rose from the grave proving that he had even conquered death itself and that through this act, we could have eternal life. A life that has no ending. John 17, 3 defines exactly what eternal life is. is that we may know God through the one He has sent, Jesus Christ. We can know Him intimately and purposely. And we can have a deep, right relationship with Him. That's the result of the gospel. And then the gospel ends with a promise that this same Jesus will return again as the reigning king of all eternity to settle all accounts. To those who have believed, they will enter into his reward. And to those who have refused to believe, they will enter into eternal judgment. They will be separated from the grace and goodness of God to experience nothing but his wrath for eternity. This is the message of the gospel. From creation to culmination, this is the message of the gospel. And that message is the common message of the church. Nothing more and nothing less will suffice for the message of the uncommon church. And as we look at the gospel and understand just what Paul is talking about here, we have an opportunity to then see two unique elements that belong to the gospel and the gospel alone. The first element that we discover, or I want us to discover this morning, is that the gospel is the revelation of God's righteousness. And it is only through the gospel that God has revealed his righteousness to humanity. It is only through the gospel that God has revealed his righteousness to humanity. That word righteousness, it means to do what is right in a relationship. 
And so what Paul is saying there in verse 17 is that through the gospel, God has demonstrated how he has done what is right in all of his relationships, in relation to his justice, in relation to his holiness, and in relation to his creation. And because of God being the creator, he has the right to do this. Now God could be unrighteous, and still be the creator and still operate in all power. But he is not. He has revealed himself to do what is right through the gospel. Why should we trust this creator God? How do we know that this God is good? Because he has revealed his righteousness in the gospel. Through the gospel we discover that God has done everything right in relationship to who He is, that His holiness, satisfied through Christ's death, deals with His justice. Holiness, justice, and love all do what is right in God. He is entirely consistent with Himself. But He's also done what is right to us. He could not let us go unpunished. What kind of judge... Would be a right. What kind of judge would God be if He just simply said, "Oh well, I know you didn't really mean to do all these terrible, bad, awful things. I'm just going to let you go." You can't do that. The law does not allow that. But rather, because of His actions in accepting the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, He has done what is right to us. He has punished our sin in Christ Jesus. So that we might have the righteousness of Him through what Christ has done. And so all that we are, all of our unrighteousness, has been placed on Christ Jesus and has been judged. And in our place, the righteousness of God has been placed upon us because of what Jesus has done. That's a righteous act. God chose to accept the substitute to exact the penalty of sin. His righteousness is revealed. In the gospel we see how the resurrection of Christ also provides the assurance that what Christ has said is true. The fact that Christ died and was raised is the evidence that what He said He went to accomplish was accomplished. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. It is the evidence that His sacrifice was acceptable to bring us to a place of eternal life. So if you want to know why we can trust the gospel, it is the fact that Christ was raised. Now, so I say, well, I don't know that Christ was raised. Well, I can appreciate that. But I would also tell you that God, knowing how important that event is, provided ample evidences for the resurrection of the Christ. There is more historical evidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than there is that George Washington ever existed. The historical evidence is overwhelming for the resurrection of the Christ because it is that important. Paul himself says that if Christ were not raised from the dead, we are of all men most foolish. Not because we've tried to come to God, but because we have believed in a lie. But we have not, because the evidence is overwhelming that Christ rose, demonstrating his sacrifice was acceptable and that his capacity to offer us eternal life is complete. Through the gospel, we find the only hope for a fallen humanity that is entirely consistent with God's nature as He has revealed it. There's a lot of different ideas out there, a lot of different thoughts, but as God has revealed His nature through the Word of God, it is only through the work of the Gospel that we find hope for fallen humanity that is consistent with who God has said He is. If the only element of the gospel was that it revealed the righteousness of God, it would be enough 
for it to be the common message of the uncommon church. But you know, Paul doesn't stop there. He also illustrates a second unique element of the gospel. And that is that the gospel is God's power for the salvation of those who will believe. The gospel is God's power for the salvation of those who will believe. The universal state of sin that humanity faces has plunged us into a state of rebellion against a holy, all-powerful God. When you look in the book of Revelation, the enemies of God are depicted as an army marching against Him. That's what they do. Those who are in rebellion against God march against Him. The reality is that we see in that final culmination that all of the armies that march against God will face a terrible, literal, physical judgment both in this life and as they enter into eternity. That's the state of humanity. Humanity is at war with God. Our sin puts us on the enemy's side against the rightful ruler and king of all that is created. And so, when we look at where the state of humanity is and the culminating result that will happen when God brings judgment, that is a frightful, frightful thing. But the gospel offers us the way to change sides. Paul writes about it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, when he simply says that we will be transferred because of, through his blood, we, let's stumble all over that and start over. That it is God through the work of Christ who has translated us out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. And so we are able to change sides because of the work that Christ has accomplished and the message of the gospel. Our single greatest need as people is the need for salvation from our sin. That's the greatest need all of humanity faces. Look, there's some things out there to have to deal with. I understand that. Look, there's, there's crime and there's racism and there's prejudice and, and there's starvation and poverty and, and there's homelessness and, and there's all of these things out there and they're big deals. But the reality is that the single greatest need that humanity has is its need for salvation from sin. Because it does not matter if we cure every disease, house every person, erase every ounce of poverty, feed every hungry. If man is not saved from his sin, he will still die and face judgment and enter an eternity separated from the goodness and the grace of God. And so... The gospel and the gospel alone provides the means of salvation. It is God's power for salvation to all who will believe. In the gospel, we have God's power to bring salvation to the hearts and lives of those who are lost in their sin. And only through the gospel can eternity be altered for sinful man. Only through the gospel can we have what Romans 5 calls peace with God. And so the gospel is God's means of unleashing His power to bring about the salvation of lost mankind. There are many out there today who would describe the gospel as one path among many into a right relationship with God. That is a lie. The gospel is not one path among many that leads to God. The gospel is the only path among many that leads to God. The gospel is like a phone number. It is not like the interstate system. In the interstate system, there are things called exits. There are ways to turn around. There are numerous means of arriving at your destination. 
A phone number is not that way. There are millions of phone numbers out there. But there's only one that is the correct number if you want to reach me on my cell phone. One. Now, if you were to dial nine of the ten digits in my phone number correctly and misdial one of them, would you be able to get me on the phone? No. It doesn't work that way. For most of us that use smartphones now, if you were to press the name of the person just above mine in your long list of contacts, would you still be able to reach me by pressing the wrong name? No. Because that links to the wrong number. The gospel is the only right number to bring about life-changing results through relationship with God. And that's it. There is no alternate <coughs> phone line. There is no alternate means. There is no alternate methodology. It is the gospel and the gospel alone that can bring salvation to the soul who is lost in their sin. This morning, in the face of the gospel, you must answer a question. You must answer the question of whether or not you will believe the message of the gospel. For it is the power of God to bring about salvation, not to everyone, but to those who believe. This is a key thought of Paul all the way through Romans. That salvation is reserved to those who will exercise their faith in believing the message of the gospel. Belief is not simply mental assent to facts. That, that's not what it means to believe. That's what we think about. It. But... In their culture and their understanding, the idea of belief was not simply, yes, I think this happened and it's true. Belief was <coughs> accepting <coughs> and acting upon what you have been told. It is not simply mental assent. It is not simply, yes, I believe this happened. But rather, it is, yes, I believe this happened and I am going to change as a result of it. It is belief that is coupled with surrender to the authority of Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. It's not simply saying yes to a series of propositional statements, but rather it is accepting those things as true and living your life in a way that says they are. This morning, perhaps you're here and you have never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus. You've never come to the place where you have believed and submitted all of who you are to Him. And if that's you today, then this is the opportunity for you to do just that. For you to exercise the faith that God has placed within you and to surrender yourself to the power of the gospel, that it might bring about salvation in your life. <coughs> I started this by saying the message of the gospel is good news, a message of hope, a message of reconciliation, and it is. You can have peace with God. But to the one that will not believe, the gospel is not good news. It is a message of condemnation. It is a message that says, if you will not believe this, you have no hope. The book of Deuteronomy ends with Moses after he relays the conditions of the covenant to his people. The book of Deuteronomy in chapter 30 has Moses laid before them. He says, today I have put before you Life and death. Choose life. This morning the gospel has been put before you. And if you have never surrendered yourself to the message of the gospel, then this morning you have had life and death placed before you as well. I implore you today 
to choose life. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. As we begin to pray, I'm going to step down in front of this table here. The musicians are going to come. They're going to sing what's called our invitation hymn. And as I finish that prayer and they begin to sing, this is your opportunity to respond to the gospel this morning. All you need to do is as they begin to sing is just step into any one of these aisles and meet me right down front here. And what we'll do is at your response, I'll pray with you here and then we will deal with your circumstances and receiving the Lord Jesus in whatever way is appropriate at that time. But this morning, if the Lord Jesus is speaking to your heart, if you've heard the gospel, and He's calling you to respond and believe, then this morning, do not reject His offer. But believe. Respond to the gospel today. And choose life for eternity. 